calling Civil Action 19-871, Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization et al. versus Wheeler et al. Council, please approach the podium and state your appearances for the record. Good morning, Your Honor. Deborah Carfora from DOJ on behalf of EPA. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Carfora. I'm uh, Bob Sussman, Your Honor, uh, for uh, Plaintiffs Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization and uh, five other nonprofit groups. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Sussman. Your Honor, I apologize. I failed to introduce my colleague, Brendan Atkins, also from DOJ on behalf of EPA. Great. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Um, all right, we are on for uh, the defendant's motion to dismiss count two, which is the APA claim in this case. And um, I guess I have kind of a, maybe a, a basic question to start with, and that is what, what does the APA cause of action uh, get you that's in addition to or more advantageous than the first cause of action under Section um, uh, 21 uh, of the uh, uh, TCSA. Yeah, I, this, is, this is probably one for me. Um, the, the two causes of action are uh, first uh, under Section 21 uh, B4 of the Toxic Substances Control Act itself and uh, the second is a cause of action under uh, the Administrative Procedure Act uh, to review the basis for the agency's uh, denial of our TSCA Section 21 petition. So I think that these are, in fact, very different remedies. Uh, they are not duplicative. Uh, they are not equivalent. Uh, they involve. Maybe, maybe you can explain to me what is it you're seeking under uh, directly under Section 21? Yeah. That, uh, and what are you seeking under 704 of the APA? Maybe you can articulate what is it that you want the court to do. Um, because I, I, I mean, looking at the complaint, I, I, I couldn't tell what the difference is. I mean, uh, it seems like the main thing you want, in addition to a declaration uh, that denial of the petition was arbitrary and capricious, you actually want uh, the court to order the EPA to initiate rulemaking uh, to, to promulgate the kind of rules that you think uh, uh, yeah, that you're right. I, under Section 21. B, the remedy is an order of the court directing EPA to initiate rulemaking as, as requested by uh, the petition. Under APA review. And, and, that, uh, and, that, and that petition, which you, which you would want then the court to order if you were to prevail on the Section 21 claim, would be uh, requiring the EPA to issue a rule that would, number one, eliminate the asbestos exe exemption, um, lower the reporting threshold, eliminate exemptions for impurities, among other things, require the immediate submission of reports on asbestos for the 2016 reporting cycle, uh, eliminate uh, and determine that reports submitted on asbestos are not confidential business information. You want the court to order the EPA to issue rules on those points. Under right? Section 21. Yes. And, and so what would the APA get you that Section 21 doesn't? Well, the, 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 for, first of all, the, the standards for relief are very different under Section 21B and under the administrative procedure. They're more advantageous to you under 21B because it's de novo review. I don't have to. Well, it's, it's de novo review and, and the uh, court must determine by a preponderance of the evidence that the chemical involved in fact presents uh, an unreasonable risk of injury. Under the, uh, the Administrative Procedure Act, the question is not whether the chemical presents an unreasonable risk of injury, 
but whether the petition denial was arbitrary uh, and capricious. So we could prevail under the uh, APA by showing that EPA's response to the petition was arbitrary and capricious uh, without necessarily showing that asbestos presents an unreasonable risk of injury and and without what ultimately what remedy would obtain okay you get a court declaration that the denial of petition was arbitrary and capricious then well, what I, yeah, I don't think that, that the court would actually be ordering EPA to undertake the rulemaking. I think the remedy in most arbitrary and capricious cases is a remand to the agency uh, to further consider the issue uh, in, in light of the basis on which the court has determined that the previous agency action was arbitrary and and capricious. So, so I think the remedies are 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 very are very different. And and as I say, the the procedure before this court is a very different procedure. The standard uh, uh, for prevailing is uh, is very different. And and there may be cases where. Uh, it is uh, a better approach for a plaintiff to file a summary judgment motion uh, under the APA, uh, making an arbitrary capricious argument, uh, rather than hunker down for uh, a trial de novo uh, with witness testimony to demonstrate to the court that the chemical presents an unreasonable risk of, of, of injury. So I, 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 I think that, that under the case law uh, uh, and, and the Supreme Court decision in the, uh, the Bowen case, um, these are not uh, equivalent remedies. These are not remedies which duplicate uh, each other, and 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 for that reason, um, the court should not conclude that the Section 21 remedy is an adequate remedy, which defeats uh, APA review. Uh, well, but let me ask you to go back, because the question is whether it's an adequate remedy. It doesn't have to be identical, but the question is adequate remedy. But before we get to there, I, I, let Excuse me. me, Your Honor, I, I didn't Sorry. quite. The question is whether there is an adequate remedy at law outside the APA, not whether there's an identical remedy. No. But, but, but before we get there, let me ask you, I want to pursue the question about yeah. the APA. If you were to obtain APA relief by demonstrating arbitrary and capricious denial of petition, in the typical course is a remand for further consideration by the APA, but um, you would have lost the the Section 21 claim, let's say, by, because you weren't able to prove by preponderance of the evidence uh, unreasonable risk of injury. Um, I, with that finding, I, I'm not sure what more you would get on a remand. I mean, what would the APA, uh, what would the EPA do um, if there's been a finding that, under, at least in the, in the trial on the Section 21, there's not been a showing of an unreasonable risk? Yeah. I don't know if you're going to get much relief under the APA. That's why I'm saying it's hard to imagine how you could lose the Section 21, win APA 704, and get some kind of meaningful relief. Yeah, no, I, I, I think actually uh, we, we could do that. I mean, if we lost Section 21, it would be because we failed to persuade the court by a preponderance of the evidence that its best is presents an unreasonable risk. Um, but that's not the question that EPA is necessarily addressing in its administrative proceeding on the petition. Uh, and, and the issue there uh, is, is whether EPA has uh, reasonable and supportable grounds for not requiring the relief that we're asking for, which is the Section 8 uh, rulemaking. It may well be that even though there isn't an unreasonable risk of injury, uh, uh, EPA has, has failed to seriously address the merits of this petition. It hasn't provided 
uh, a reasonable basis to conclude that there's no need for reporting requirements under, under Section 8A. And in a situation like that, we would demonstrate to the court that the petition response is inadequate, uh, that, the, that the agency has not grappled with the real issues, that the agency needs to take another look at the petition. And that would be irrespective of whether asbestos presents an unreasonable risk within the meaning of Section 24.1b4. I, I guess that's what I'm having trouble understanding. How could it be, let's say that on remand, EPA does what it's supposed to reconsider. Yeah. And, but na it now reconsiders in light of a court finding that asbestos does not constitute an unreasonable risk of injury. Uh, would it, is there still a way that the EPA could be found to be arbitrary if it didn't eliminate the asbestos exemption? With that finding in mind, well, or lowering the th reporting threshold requirement. Well, I, 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 I think that that you know whether a court finds that asbestos presents an an unreasonable risk of injury is 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 not the driver of uh, whether number one EPA does a full and diligent evaluation of the risks of asbestos. Uh, which is what it's doing right now, and, 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 and number two, whether EPA has uh, defensible grounds for concluding that it doesn't require reporting on asbestos under Section 8A. And it, it, it's, it's quite conceivable that, that the court could conclude after a lengthy de novo proceeding, well, Asbestos is a, is a bad chemical, but, uh, you know, the evidence before me doesn't quite reach the unreasonable risk threshold. But EPA still has an independent of, uh, obligation to evaluate the chemical and is, in fact, evaluating the chemical and may regulate it. And we say that EPA needs this information under Section 8A because this is the sort of information that is necessary and indeed essential for uh, a careful, protective evaluation of asbestos' risks. All right, let me, let me ask, uh, give the government counsel Ms. Carr for a chance to respond to at least the, the narrow point that I was looking at. W what's your response to the idea that there is some value in an EPA remedy here that transcends the remedy under Section 21 of the TSCA. We we agree with the court, Your Honor, that there's. Um, Why don't you speak into the microphone so the council can hear you? Right. The more advantageous remedy for plaintiffs here would be under Section 21 of TSCA. Um, I, I want to just for full candor explain that we have a different view of what the remedy would be under TSCA Section 21. So. Um, the way the court described it, the way I heard it, was that uh, an unreasonable risk finding by the court under Section TOSCO 21 would require, require EPA to actually regu regulate in the way that was requested by the petition. That is not EPA's position. Right. That's what they're seeking, I think, in the complaint, as I understood it. That is what they're seeking, right. I think, and I, I understood the court to be saying that that's the remedy that will be provided by 21. That that's not the position that EPA takes. Okay. I mean, what is what is the EPA's position? <laughs> uh, EPA's position would be that uh, if the court were to make an unreasonable finding under Section 21, then the court would order EPA to initiate the rulemaking that was requested, such that EPA would. Um, engage in the administrative process, which includes um, public notice and review. And if um, after that process uh, there was some other regulatory function that could address, address the risk, the EPA could regulate in that manner. So Would it have to take that risk as given, though, once a court finds that asbestos is, if it were to find that asbestos presents an unreasonable risk of injury? Well, I could tell you, um, I can't answer that question directly yet because uh, I'm not sure that my, um, I haven't had that conversation with my client yet, but um, it is my understanding right now that if the court were to make the finding of an unreasonable risk, depending on which provision of TSCA the rulemaking is, petition, is, is seeking, um, then EPA would accept the unreasonable risk finding and then proceed to regulate that risk in the manners available to it under the statute.
All right. So may not may or may not encompass the four things that the plaintiff asks, but presumably, and maybe you're hesitant to commit to this, the EPA would have to accept the court's finding or proceed with the court's finding that asbestos creates an unreasonable risk of injury and then figure out how to regulate that. That's correct. Right. Well, um, but if I, if I may, yeah. just with that understanding in mind, I still agree with the court, though, that um, the plaintiffs here do not get anything by in, um, simultaneous review through the APA because, um, again, the remedy under the APA is just to remand to, to the EPA. So EPA would just reconsider the petition. EPA could still deny the petition uh, after the EPA um, I'm sorry, after reconsideration, um, because it may address the issues the court found to be arbitrary and capricious, um, or may better explain those or offer better justifications, where under Section 21, EPA does actually have to engage in that rulemaking now, you know, with the idea that what the regulation may ultimately be may not necessarily be what plaintiffs are asking for. Can I, can I make a point here, yep. Your Honor? Um, I, on the issue of which is the more advantageous remedy, um, you know, we could very quickly file a summary judgment motion uh, under the APA, uh, and that would lead to a fairly rapid decision. Uh, we might decide, we haven't made that call yet, but we might decide that uh, that is a more advantageous path than uh, the de novo proceeding uh, before the court, which would involve discovery and, and a hearing and expert testimony and other witness testimony. We might say to ourselves, if, if we can get some near-term relief under the APA, that's a better outcome for us than uh, than, than going through the, uh, the trial de novo. And, and yes, I mean, in an ideal world, uh, to get the court to direct EPA to, uh, to begin the rulemaking is, is, is certainly a good, a good outcome. But um, it may be that faced with the decision that the petition denial was arbitrary and capricious, uh, EPA might actually say, uh, okay, we'll reconsider this petition and maybe, maybe we'll grant it. So um, I, I don't think there can be any presumption that it's more advantageous for us. So to there's a procedural advantage is, is what you're saying. You may not be in the end outcome advantage, well, at least in the near term, but there's a procedural advantage because you can proceed without a trial and proceed more quickly and get relief, although the relief is more limited because it, it is a remand back to the agency to reconsider, it doesn't force the agency necessarily to undertake rulemaking, but forces right. them. But but I think that in in looking at the adequacy of of the remedy, um, you you want to take a, a a fairly holistic approach, and and you want to ask how do the two remedies compare uh, a, along a number of of parameters. One certainly is the procedural burden. Um, I, I don't think that's irrelevant at all. Uh, another, uh, another factor is uh, uh, the standard that the court would apply in deciding whether there should be uh, a remedy. I, you can argue that, that one standard is tougher than the other. You can argue that the other way around. Oh, but I'm not sure you can, that de novo is always a lot easier to, to prove than Excuse me? De novo is easier to prove, make your case, than when you're up against an abuse of discretion standard. Well, it's, I, you know, arbitrary and, and, and capricious is, is uh, by no means a daunting standard. I, 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 I think that the agency does get some of the benefit of the doubt, but, you know, the real issue is going to be has the agency explained uh, in a rational and transparent way um, why it's denying the petition. And, and my view would be that when you look at the agency's denial, uh, there's really a lot, of, uh, a lot of double talk, a lot of evasion. It's really not very cogent. 
Your Honor, I just I, I want to address. I think that plaintiff's counsel has just identified the, the real issue here. From what I can tell from reading the briefs, and specifically footnote 12 on page 17, it does seem that the um, the reason why they want both APA review and task review is uh, to first go through APA, which they consider to be a less burdensome procedure, um, see if they can get relief, and if they cannot, at that point, move towards uh, the, um, the larger procedure, more time-consuming procedure under de novo review. And I think that is exactly what the APA, um, Section 704 specifically, is prevents or prohibits. Well, let, let, let's get to the heart of the matter. Um, Environmental Defense Fund versus Riley, uh, the D.C. Circuit case. Um, why isn't that exactly our case here? Uh, it, 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 it could be viewed as our case, but, but in fact, uh, the analysis that the court used there, I, I would submit, is, is very different from the 704 analysis that, that should have been uh, conducted. The, the court didn't mention the Bowen decision. It barely mentioned 704. And I think when you look at the rationale for the court's holding, it's, it's, it, it's basically sort of uh, uh, based on, on legislative intent, on the notion that Congress could not have conceivably envisioned uh, to uh, disparate, uh, antithetical remedies, and 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 so therefore uh, uh, the statute properly construed uh, limits uh, plaintiffs to the uh, the section 21b uh, remedy. It's interesting to me that in in that decision the court actually goes to some lengths to talk about how the APA remedy is very different from the section. 21 remedy and the points that the court makes are are uh, not all that different from the points that uh, that we are making and and I, I think a fair reading of the court's analysis is these are not interchangeable remedies they're really very different now the court found that to be offensive frankly under the facts of the case and uh, and and determined uh, that that uh, it would it would be unreasonable to allow uh, uh, an APA remedy alongside of a section uh, 21b remedy, but but I I think that that's a policy judgment by the court. Uh, it's not based on a comparison of the adequacy of the two remedies, which is the key issue. Under under 704. So, um, yeah, I mean the case is certainly very relevant, but uh, the rationale for the case we would just submit is 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 not uh, a legally uh, adequate rationale, and the court shouldn't follow it. And what about the Ninth Circuit's decision in uh, Coos County Board uh, versus Kempthorne? Which one is that? A Coos County board that involved the Endangered Species Act, citizen suit provision, and the APA, where, uh, again, the court, uh, Ninth Circuit, said that um, uh, because uh, the, the review of the Coos County's claim was available under the Endangered Species Act, um, the plaintiff couldn't proceed under the APA. Do you have any? Thought, but why? Why is the? Why isn't that uh, uh, informative here? Um, your, your Honor, I'm I, I'm not as familiar with that case as I should be. But there oh. is another Ninth Circuit case that is cited in the briefs, the uh, the Brim Air Disposal v. Cone case, and and that is uh, a case where. Uh, the court found that uh, the, the citizen suit remedy under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act uh, was an exclusive remedy and, and defeated review under the APA. What's interesting about that, that case is the court emphasized how broad and all-encompassing uh, the statutory remedy 
was. And, and it said, in effect, that the only material difference between APA review and uh, the citizen suit remedy uh, is that under the citizen suit, you have to give 60 days notice, whereas under the APA, you don't. And, and the court held that that is simply not a material difference, and otherwise the two remedies are, are on all four. Well, did the court premise the, uh, the bar of the APA on the remedies being exactly on all fours? Which, which one? In, in, in the Brem Air case, are you saying that was a predicate to the court's decision that the RCRA remedy was identical? Yeah, the- I, I, I think so. At the end of the court's opinion, there's uh, uh, a discussion where the court says, you know, this is an extremely broad, all-encompassing remedy uh, under under RICRA, and and then they discuss how the the only difference seems to be whether there is a 60-day notice uh, requirement or or not. But I think in the end, they basically decided that 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 difference in and of itself was just not material enough to conclude that there was something different about the APA remedy. All right, what's, what's your response to the, to the Bremer? It, was, did that case hinge on the fact that there, it was essentially identical, the two remedies were identical? That's not my reading, Your Honor. Um, in fact, I just want to, if I could quote Bremer, uh, where the Ninth Circuit said, indeed, as far as we can tell, every court that has addressed the question has agreed. If a plaintiff can bring a suit against the responsible federal agencies under a citizen suit provision, this action precludes an an additional suit under the APA. Ninth Circuit went on to say, we will not swim against such a cohesive tide of authority because the RICRA citizen suit provision constitutes an adequate remedy. We lack jurisdiction to review Bremer's But did the court go into analysis of how the citizen suit provision of the RCRA was essentially identical to the APA? Uh, not, not in my reading. I mean, what the court was looking at, I just want to say, um, it's my understanding that the um, plaintiffs in that case failed to comply with the um, notice requirement, statutory right. notice requirement. And because they failed to comply with the requirement, they were unable to bring a cause of action under RICRA and instead relied on the presumption of reviewability under the APA to say that they should then be entitled to APA review because Congress intended the agency action to be reviewed. Um, The court just disagreed with that and said that uh, the presumption of reviewability didn't apl- could not be applied to allow the plaintiffs to get around the statutory requirements under RICRA. And I think that supports us, uh, as support, as supports EPA here because um, even in that case, the Ninth Circuit, even in the case where plaintiffs were not going to get any review whatsoever of the agency action, the Ninth Circuit would not go as far to apply the, the APA in that case. I also want to address um, the the Boeing issue that we've been talking about. Before you do that, let me ask. Um, I don't have the whole RC, RC, RICRA before me. What what is the remedy and the standard applied in a citizen suit under RICRA? Is it a, uh, is it a uh, is it an abuse of discretion standard? Is I it- think it's pretty darn broad. I I do believe that the language is 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 in the opinion. Um, but I, 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 I do think it's pretty broad. Your Honor, I, don't, I haven't looked at Rick Ray in a little bit, but um, I consider Rick Ray very close to CERCLA in terms of the remedy that's provided. Um, so it provides for monetary relief to clean up environmental damage caused by the, the Rick Ray violation. Well, in that case, it was a uh, competition in contracting, um, well, hmm. uh, wasn't that a claim by a disappointed contractor? 
it was the uh, city garbage um, contractor who had contracted to have um, all of the city's um, disposable waste, hazardous waste, uh, and he, uh, the contractor brought suit under two claims, um, and he was using a, um, a provision of TOSCA that required RICRA, was it? I'm sorry, yes. It was a provision of RICWA that required the um, federal agency to comply with all local ha um, hazardous waste disposal. Um, so the argument went that uh, because the contractor had a contract with the city to remove all of its disposable waste, there was a violation of RICRA by not, by the federal agencies not also contracting with that particular plaintiff. And again, and, and that, damages were sought. And um, were damages sought as a remedy under RICRA? That I do not know. I do have the case right here, though. All right. Well, I, I will look at that. Um, it, it, that seems to be the critical question, and that is whether uh, there is an, a, another adequate remedy uh that exists that could obviate the need for uh, uh um, judicial review under 704 of the apa um, and i don't think the term adequate necessarily means identical it may be slightly different it may be better maybe slightly worse but if there is a prescribed remedy that in a perhaps general sense is adequate um it seems to me the the gist of the cases, both in the um, this circuit as well as the D.C. circuit and other, I think some other cases as well, says you can't have both. That's that's how I read it. But I will take a second Wait, look. Which case you're referring? Well, to? I'm I'm talking about uh, starting with the Environmental Defense versus yeah. Riley. I'm yeah. talking about the Coos County Board case. I think the Rem Air case seems to suggest that. Um, there are other cases involving CERCLA, the Sierra Club, um, and even Bowen. Bowen itself, I mean, that, that, that's the, the gist. Um, I guess it uses the term special review procedures, if there are the special review procedures, that 704 doesn't apply. And perhaps that's then been interpreted expanding to, to mean other kinds I, I, of remedies. I think it's clear from the Bowen decision that the existence of a special uh, uh, review procedure in, in the statute is 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 not sufficient to defeat review under the APA. That that procedure needs to be uh, needs to be adequate. And um, the court in in in, in Bowen it, it said that that Congress created this exception to APA review because it did not quote want to duplicate, and I underscore the word duplicate, the previously established special statutory procedures relating to specific agencies. And it then went on to emphasize that the exception should not be construed to defeat the central purpose of providing a broad spectrum of judicial review of agency action and refer to the, uh, the, the courts uh, uh, previous recognition of the broad and generous review provisions in in the APA. So I think that that the backdrop here is that there's uh, a well recognized policy favoring uh, APA review, and um, therefore that needs to inform the determination of of whether a remedy is 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 adequate. Uh, or or not, and yes, maybe the remedy doesn't need to be uh, absolutely identical, but I think the court needs to avoid making a policy judgment uh, that that the goals of, of of the statute and the objectives of the plaintiff uh, will be fulfilled by uh, the existing judicial review. Uh, decision. In other words, I, I would be careful not to interpret adequacy 
in a very expansive way because well, how would you define it then i mean it, it is in the words of the statute 704 says for which there is no other adequate remedy in any court how would you how would you interpret what's your definition or, or construction of that term well i would i, I would say that 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 a remedy is inadequate where uh, uh, the process available to the plaintiff in uh, the statutory uh, review proceeding, the standard that the court applies in that proceeding, uh, and the type of remedy which is available are different. And, and those, I would say, are indicia of lack of, of, of adequacy, and, and I would be weary of, of making a, a value judgment that yes, the remedies are different, and there might be very good reasons why a plaintiff might choose one over the other, uh, but nonetheless, we're gonna say that the APA remedy is, uh, uh, the, the statutory remedy is is inadequate. And I, I think when you look at the cases here uh, that have been uh, cited in, in the brief, most of these cases are cases where the courts actually held that the statutory remedy was not adequate. Um, there are uh, a few cases that have, that have held to the contrary, uh, but there are two DC Circuit cases cited uh, by the government that in fact concluded that APA review was available. Uh, there are three Supreme Court cases where uh, the court held that APA review uh, was available. There are really only a handful of cases. Three, what are the three cases that have held a parallel remedy is inadequate under 704? What, what are those cases? You said there's three Supreme Court cases that have rejected an assertion that something is an adequate remedy under 704? Yeah. What are those three cases? Okay, that is uh, Bowen v. Massachusetts, uh, which we talked about. That is uh, Sackett v. EPA, uh, 2012 decision, and then... Well, in that, uh, case, in that case, the, the plaintiff had no remedy. Uh, absent that, action that's by that's absent action by the EPA, that plaintiff was stuck, while while fines were accru were accruing, had no remedy. I, I would I would not agree with that. I think the argument of the government in in that case is is that you know if 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 the uh, the private party uh, wished to challenge EPA's determination of of noncompliance, it could do so in defending an enforcement action. It could do so by applying for a permit and appealing uh, the denial of the permit if, 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 if that's what happened. Uh, the government made a very forceful argument in both of these cases that there are plenty of remedies available under the Clean Water Act. The court concluded not that these remedies weren't available, but that the, the APA remedy was more advantageous to the plaintiff. And the other case is Hawks, I, I take it. Excuse me? The other Supreme Court case you were about to mention, the third one is Hawks. Well, the third, the third one is very similar to the second one. This is the, uh, the Hawks case right. where, uh, again, under the, uh, the Clean Water Act, the, uh, uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers made a jurisdictional determination. In other words, a determination that certain water bodies were uh, waters of the United States, and uh, the the argument was that uh, that determination could be challenged in a number of of different ways under the Clean Water Act. That APA review was not really uh, needed, but but the court said that the availability of APA review of the jurisdictional determination before EPA had taken any enforcement action and before any permit application had been filed, um, that, that, uh, that, that would, would have adverse consequences for the plaintiff. And so therefore, APA review should be, should be available. I, I would also cite uh, uh, 
uh, an en banc decision by the D.C. Circuit, Cohn v. Uh, U.S. and uh, the El Rio v. HHS decision of the D.C. Circuit. Those are two cases where uh, the court concluded that the statutory remedy was available and upheld uh, APA review. So I, I, I don't think we could say that we have a, 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 a big number of cases on one hand uh, denying APA review and a small number of cases allowing it. I, I think the predominance of these decisions uh, uphold the availability of review under the APA. All right, let, let me give the government a chance to respond to the uh, Bowen second Hawks uh, citations. And just very quickly before I do that, Your Honor, I just want to clarify Bremer disposal. The plaintiff in that case was seeking declaratory, injunctive, and monetary relief under RICRA. Um, the Boeing case. Different. You don't get monetary relief under APA, right? No, you don't. No, you don't. So there's a difference, but that difference wasn't enough for the Ninth Circuit to say no. So it can't, it's got to be something more than just a difference. But go ahead, explain the. Um, there's simply just no foundation for the idea that Boeing requires equivalency in scope and operation. If, if you look at the text of Boeing itself, first, um, the analysis that the court did focused on whether the availability of review and the availability of relief was adequate in an alternate forum. And never compared the scope of review or the scope of relief to that that was available under the APA. The examples that the Supreme Court cites to in Boeing itself can directly contradict plaintiff's point here in fact, Boeing said that um, Congress intended to avoid duplication of, for example, an in interstate commerce, commerce orders that were subject to review in specially constituted three-judge district courts. That would be a different forum, of course. And then it also cited as an example Federal Trade Commission and National Labor Relations Board orders that were directly reviewable in the regional courts of appeal, appeals. So that those two examples of themselves cited by the Boeing court are examples of um, different scopes of review. And then the Boeing court itself engaged, in, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, then there's persuasive case law in the DC circuit that relies on Boeing in expressly rejecting the proposition that plaintiffs are offering here. Um, so long as it, it says um, the plaintiffs must not, or the remedy must not provide relief that's identical to the relief under the APA, so long as it offers relief in the same genre. And that was Garcia v. Vilsack in the D.C. Circuit, 2009. Um, that's consistent with the Boeing court analysis, because dismissing the APA claim in those cases would have resulted in barring review of the agency actions altogether. Or, um, and that's just not the case here. Um, the, the plaintiffs here, even if the court dismisses the APA claim, still have availability of review in the district court, federal district court, so it's the same forum, and they um, still get a remedy and uh, arguably a remedy that's more advantageous than they would otherwise get under All the right, APA. Why don't you address Sack and Hawks real quick? Yeah. Well, Sack and Hawks is the same issue, is that the, um, there was no alternate remedy. So the agency actions being challenged in Sacks and Hawks were agency actions for which there was no specific review procedures offered in the Clean Water Act. And um, the government in those cases argued that the, um, the specific review procedures that did exist in the Clean Water Act should be meant to re read to preclude uh, review for agency actions under the APA. That, that's not the case here. That's not the argument here. Um, and in those cases, if the court were to decline APA review, those um, plaintiffs would have no remedy at all. So I think the court rightly identified the distinction there to this case. In fact, all of the cases um, that plaintiffs cite to um, all have the same distinction 
in that there was no alternate remedy at all, regardless of whether that remedy was adequate or not, one did not exist. Uh, because there exists an alternate remedy here in the same forum and with better relief, under the Boeing analysis, uh, that would be adequate, uh, an adequate alternate re remedy. Uh, you know, uh, I, I would disagree with that characterization of the cases because uh, there, in fact, were alternate re remedies in, in all of them. And it was on the basis of those alternate remedies that the government argued uh, that there was no need for the APA remedy. So um, I, 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 I do believe the question is not binary issue. Is there an alternate remedy or isn't there an alternate remedy? The, the, the question is whether the alternate remedy is, is, uh, is, is adequate uh, or not. And we have several cases holding that the alternate remedy uh, was not adequate. I, I would also point, Your Honor, to the savings provision in Section 21B5, uh, which explicitly recognizes that uh, any alternate remedies that might be available uh, are not precluded uh, under, under Section 21. Um, and, and maybe this language doesn't say in so many words that there is uh, review available under the APA, uh, but it certainly reflects an expectation uh, that remedies other than the statutory remedy in Section uh, 21B uh, would be allowed to stand. They would not be expunged. And, um, uh, it's interesting that, that uh, there are some provisions uh, in TSCA where this, this savings clause appears, but there are other judicial review provisions where uh, it doesn't. So this was not, I, 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 I think, a, a mindless action uh, by, uh, by Congress. And, and in fact, uh, Congress was well aware of the uh, availability of APA review uh, in the original uh, 1976 legislative process. Um, uh, there are references to the APA in the legislative history. There are references to uh, the APA and other provisions uh, of the law. And, and so it's what, are you saying, you're, you're saying in the uh, TSCA legislative history, there's yeah. express reference to preserving the APA uh, remedy notwithstanding a Section 21 action? Well, I, I, I don't want to overstate this point, Your Honor, but the legislative history uh, does say that in, in a case where the petition is not seeking issuance of a new rule but is seeking uh, uh, revision or repeal uh, of an existing rule that uh, review would be available uh, under the APA, and that's, of course, not our situation here, but I think it, it demonstrates a, an awareness on the part of Congress of the availability of APA review, and I think it sheds some light on this savings clause, and, and I would go further and, and, and say there's absolutely nothing in the legislative history uh, that, that, that says that APA review would not be available for uh, uh, Section 21 petition uh, denial. So I, I, I think the savings clause is, is a, a pretty strong indicator of congressional. You, you would acknowledge that in Brem Air, the court rejected, in Brem Air, the Ninth Circuit rejected a parallel argument trying to rely upon the savings clause of rec RECRA. And the court said no. I mean, well, maybe they're a little different. I don't know. Maybe the legislative hit, but I mean, um, that the problem with the savings clause argument, it presumes the APA is available in the first place. I mean, it's a little bit of a chicken or an egg. But if the, but if yeah. the APA says it doesn't apply, the fact that TSCA says, well, we don't, 
I mean, to preclude other remedies that might be available, such as under the APA, but the APA doesn't make it available, it doesn't help in the end. It doesn't get us around the first question, how do you construe the adequate remedy clause of, of Section 704? Well, I, I, I agree with that, and I think the core question is the adequacy of, of the statutory remedy, but I, but I think it's, 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 it's highly suggestive that there is a savings clause because that is some evidence that uh, Congress did not want to expunge alternative remedies, and um, you put that together with the legislative history showing that Congress was well aware of the APA, and I think that's certainly a factor uh, that would dictate some caution in determining that APA uh, review is not available. When was TSCA enacted? Excuse me? When was TSCA enacted? 1976. All right, I'll, I'll take the matter under submission. Okay, thank you. Thank Honor. you.